Section One of the Dream of the Red Chamber, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Li Qing. The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book One, by Cao Xueqing, translated by Henry Bancroft Jolly. Preface. This translation was suggested not by any pretensions to range myself among the ranks of the body of Sinologue, but by the perplexities and difficulties experienced by me as a student in Beijing when, at the completion of the Zi Er Ji, I had to plunge in the maze of the Hong Lou Meng. Shortcomings are, I feel sure, to be discovered, both in the prose as well as among the doggerel and uncouth rhymes in which the text has been more adhered to than rhythm but i shall feel satisfied with the result if i succeed even in the least degree in affording a helping hand to present and future students of the chinese language h bancroft jolly h b m vice consulate macau first september eighteen ninety one the Dream of the Red Chamber, Chapter One. Zhen Shiying, in a vision, apprehends perception and spirituality. Jia Yucun, in the windy and dusty world, cherishes fond thoughts of a beautiful maiden. This is the opening section. This the first chapter. Subsequent to the visions of a dream which he had, on some previous occasion, experienced, the writer personally relates. He designedly concealed the true circumstances and borrowed the attributes of perception and spirituality to relate the story of the record of the stone. With this purpose, he made use of such designations as Zhen Shi Ying, truth under the garb of fiction, and the like. What are, however, the events recorded in this work? Who are the dramatis personae? wearied with the drudgery experienced of late in the world the author speaking for himself goes on to explain with the lack of success which attended every single concern i suddenly bethought myself of the womankind of past ages passing one by one under a minute scrutiny i felt that in action and in law one and all were far above me that in spite of the majesty of my manliness i could not in point of fact compare with these characters of the gender sex and my shame forsooth then knew no bounds while regret on the other hand was of no avail as there was not even a remote possibility of a day of remedy on this very day it was that i became desirous to compile in connected form for publication throughout the world with a view to universal information how that i bear in exorable and manifold retribution inasmuch as what time by the sustenance of the benevolence of heaven and the virtue of my ancestors my apparel was rich and fine, and as what days my fare was savoury and sumptuous. I disregarded the bounty of education and nurture of father and mother, and paid no heed to the virtue of percept and injunction of teachers and friends, with the result that I incurred the punishment of failure recently in the least trifle, and the reckless waste of half my lifetime there have been meanwhile generation after generation those in the inner chambers the whole mass of whom could not on any account be through my influence allowed to fall into extinction in order that i unfilial as i have been may have the means to screen my own shortcomings hence it is that the hatchet shed with bamboo mat windows the bed of tow and the stuff of brick which are at present my share are not sufficient to deter me from carrying out the fixed purpose of my mind and could i furthermore confront the morning breeze the evening moon the willows by the steps and the flowers in the courtyard methinks these would moisten to greater degree my mortal pen with ink but though i lack culture and erudition what harm is there however in employing fiction and unrecondite language to give utterance to the merits of these characters and were I also able to induce the image of the inner chamber to understand and diffuse them, could I besides break the weariness of even so much as a single moment, 
or could I open the eyes of my contemporaries, will it not forsooth prove a boon? This consideration has led to the usage of such name as Jia Yu Cun and other similar appellations. More than any in these pages have been employed such words as dreams and visions, but these dreams constitute the main argument of this work, and combine, furthermore, the design of giving a word of warning to my readers. Reader, can you suggest whence the story begins? The narration may border on the limits of incoherency and triviality, but it possesses considerable zest. But to begin. The Empress, Nu Wo, the goddess of works, in fashioning blocks of stones for the repair of the heavens, prepared, at the Da Huang Hills and Wu Ji Cave, 36,501 blocks of rough stone, each 12 zhang in height and 24 zhang square. Of these stones, the Empress Wu only used 36,500, so that one single block remained over and above, without being turned to any account. This was cast down the Qinggeng Peak. This stone, strange to say, after having undergone a process of refinement, attained a nature of efficiency, and could, by its innate powers, set itself into motion, and was able to expand and to contract. When it became aware that the whole number of blocks had been made use of to repair the heavens, that it alone had been destitute of the necessary properties, and had been unfit to attain selection, it forthwith felt within itself vexation and shame, and day and night it gave way to anguish and sorrow. One day, while it lamented its lot, it suddenly caught sight, at a great distance, of a Buddhist bonze and of a Taoist priest coming towards that direction. Their appearance was uncommon, their easy manner remarkable. When they drew near this Qinggeng peak, they sat on the ground to rest, and began to converse. But on noticing the block, newly polished and brilliantly clear, which had moreover contracted in dimensions, and become no larger than the pendant of a fan, they were greatly filled with admiration. Buddhist priest picked it up, and laid it in the palm of his hand. "'Your appearance,' he said laughingly, "'may well declare you to be a supernatural object.' but as you lack any inherent quality, it is necessary to inscribe a few characters on you, so that every one who shall see you may at once recognize you to be a remarkable thing, and subsequently, when you will be taken into a country where honor and affluence will reign, into a family cultured in mind and of official status, in a land where flowers and trees shall flourish with luxuriance, in a town of refinement, renown and glory, when you once will have been there, the stone listened with intense delight. "'What characters may I ask?' it consequently inquired. "'Will you inscribe? And what place will I be taken to? Pray, pray explain to me in lucid terms.' "'You mustn't be inquisitive,' the bonze replied, with a smile. "'In days to come you will certainly understand everything.' Having concluded these words, he forthwith put the stone in his sleeve, and proceeded leisurely on his journey, in company with the Taoist priest. Whether, however, he took the stone is not divulged, nor can it be known how many centuries and ages elapsed, before a Taoist priest, Kong Kong by name, passed, during his researches after the eternal reason and his quest after immortality, by these Da Huang Hills, Wu Ji Cave, and Qinggeng Peak. Suddenly perceiving a large block of stone, on the surface of which the traces of characters giving, in a connected form, the various incidents of its fate could be clearly deciphered. Kong Kong examined them from first to last. They, in fact, explained how that this block of worthless stone had originally been devoid of the properties essential for the repairs to the heavens, how it would be transmuted into human form, and introduced by Mang Mang the High Lord, and Miao Miao the Divine, into the world of mortals, and how it would be led over the other bank, across the Sansara. On the surface, the record of the spot where it would fall, the place of its birth, as well as various family trifles and trivial love affairs of young ladies, verses, 
odes, speeches, and enigmas was still complete. But the name of the dynasty and the year of the reign were obliterated, and could not be ascertained. On the obverse were also the following enigmatical verses. Lacking in virtues meet the azure skies to mend, In vain the mortal world full many a year I wend. Of a former and after life these facts that be, Who will for tradition strange record for me? Kong Kong the Taoist, having pondered over these lines for a while, became aware that the stone had a history of some kind. Brother Stone, he forthwith said, addressing the stone, the concerns of past days recorded on you possess, according to your own account, a considerable amount of interest, and have been for this reason inscribed with the intent of soliciting generations to hand them down as remarkable occurrences. But, in my own opinion, they lack, in the first place, any data by means of which to establish the name of the emperor and the year of his reign, and, in the second place, these constitute no record of any excellent policy, adopted by any high worthies or high loyal statesmen in the government of the state or in the rule of public morals. The contents simply treat of a certain number of maidens of exceptional character, either of their love affairs or infatuations, or of their small deserts or insignificant talents, and were I to transcribe the whole collection of them, they would, nevertheless, not to be estimated as a book of any exceptional worth. Sir Priest, the stone replied with assurance, why are you so excessively dull? The dynasties recorded in the rustic histories, which have been written from age to age, have, I am fain to think, invariably assumed, under false pretenses, the mere nomenclature of the Hang and Tang dynasties. They differ from the events inscribed on my block, which do not borrow this customary practice, but, being based on my own experiences and natural feelings, present, on the contrary, a novel and unique character. Besides, in the pages of these rustic histories, either the aspersions upon sovereigns and statesmen, or the strictures upon individuals, their wives and their daughters, or the deeds of licentiousness and violence are too numerous to be computed. Indeed, there is one more kind of loose literature, the wantonness and pollution, in which work most easy havoc upon youth. As regards the works in which the characters of scholars and beauties is delineated, their allusions are again repeatedly of Wen Jun, their theme in every page of Zi Jian. A thousand volumes present no diversity, and a thousand characters are but a counterpart of each other. What is more, these works, throughout all their pages, cannot help bordering on extreme license. The authors, however, had no other object in view than to give utterance to a few sentimental odes and elegant ballads of their own, and for this reason they have fictitiously invented the names and surnames of both men and women, and necessarily introduced, in addition, some low characters, who should, like a buffoon in a play, create some excitement in the plot. Still more loathsome is a kind of pedantic and profligate literature, perfectly devoid of all natural sentiment, full of self-contradictions. And, in fact, the contrast to those maidens in my work, whom I have, during half of my lifetime, seen with my own eyes and heard with my own ears, and though I will not presume to estimate them as superior to the heroes and heroines in the works of former ages, yet the perusal of the motives and issues of their experiences may likewise afford matter sufficient to banish dullness and to break the spell of melancholy. As regards the several stanzas of doggerel verse, they may too evoke such laughter as to compel the reader to blurt out the rice and to spurt out the wine. In these pages, the scenes depicting the anguish of separation, the bliss of reunion, and the fortunes of prosperity and of adversity are all, in every detail, true to human nature. And I have not taken upon myself to make the slightest addition or alteration which might lead to the perversion of the truth. My only object has been that men may, after the drinking bout, or after they wake from sleep, 
or when in need of relaxation from the pressure of business, take up this light literature and not only expunge the traces of antiquated books and obtain a new kind of distraction, but that they may also lay by a long life as well as energy and strength for it bears no point of similarity to those works whose designs are false whose course is immoral now sir priest what are your views on the subject kong kong having pondered for a while over the words to which he had listened intently reperused throughout this record of the stone and finding that the general purport consisted of naught else than a treatise on love and likewise of an accurate transcription of facts without the least taint of profligacy injurious to the times he thereupon copied the contents from beginning to end to the intent of charging the world to hand them down as a strange story hence it was that kong kong the taoist in consequence of his perception in his state of abstraction of passion the generation from this passion of voluptuousness the transmission of this voluptuousness into passion and the apprehension by means of passion of its unreality forthwith altered his name from that of qing sen the voluptuous bonds and changed the title of the memoir of a stone shi tou ji for that of Qing Sen Lu, the record of the voluptuous bonds, while Kong Mei Xi of Dong Lu gave it the name of Feng Yue Bao Jian, the precious mirror of voluptuousness. In later years, owing to the devotion by Cao Xue Qing in the Dao Hong study, of ten years to the perusal and revision of the work, the additions and modifications effected by him five times, the affix of an index and the division into periods and chapters, the book was again titled Jing Ling Shi Er Chai, The Twelve Maidens of Jing Ling. A stanza was furthermore composed for the purpose this then and no other is the origin of the record of the stone the poet says appositely pages full of silly litter tears a handful sour and bitter all a fool the author hold but their zest who can unfold you have now understood the causes which brought about the record of the stone but as you are not as yet aware what characters are depicted and what circumstances are related on the surface of the block reader please lend an ear to the narrative on the stone which runs as follows end of section one